Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Well, Shabbat Shalom. We're continuing in our series on the Gospel of Mark, and today is part 29. And today's message is from uh, chapter 13 of Mark, and it's about uh, the end times and the return of Messiah. Uh, and if you want to know more details about this amazing topic, please attend John McKee's class this afternoon at 2.15 because he's going to be speaking today on exactly this topic, uh, except in much more detail uh, than I'm going to have time to get into uh, this morning. So, Mark 13, beginning in verse 24, um, and we have it on the overhead. And Yeshua says, but in those days, following at the stress, the sun will be darkened. And the moon won't give its light. And the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he'll send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so. When you see these things happening, know that it's near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation shall not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. For about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Therefore, be on guard, be alert. You don't know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each one with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door, keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you don't know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, don't let him find you sleeping. When I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Amen. Now, Mark 13 is Mark's version of what's known as the Olivet Discourse because it's delivered on the Mount of Olives. Uh, And and, uh, it begins with Yeshua telling his disciples that both Jerusalem and the temple will be destroyed. And in fact, one generation, uh, 40 years later, in 70 CE, it was indeed destroyed by the Romans. Now, the temple consisted of these enormous stones. Uh, And yet Yeshua says in Mark 13, verse 2, Do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And then the disciples, in response to that, the disciples asked this question in Mark 13, verse 4. Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the, the sign that they're about to be fulfilled? And then in response to this question, Yeshua begins to teach. Now, the first half of Mark 13, uh, concerning the gospel and and Yeshua as the Messiah, highlights the theme, also found in the book of Hebrews, of Yeshua as our ultimate sin and guilt offering, and as as the the very presence of God. And therefore, the temple and the sacrificial system, they're the one who they point to him. He's the one they point to. Uh, And this rich biblical symbolism and typology of God dwelling with us, pictured in the Holy of Holies, uh, and God being our kapora, our covering for sin, as depicted on the mercy seat uh, uh, and the ark, uh, and the blood of the sacrifice being applied by the high priest, I don't keep poor. All this is ultimately fulfilled in the person and the work of Yeshua. And that's why in the new heavens and the new earth, there'll, be no, there'll no longer be a physical temple. So we read this in Revelation 21, verse 22. I saw no temple in it, uh, in, the, in the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. For the, Lord, the God, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. Hallelujah. But in our passage today, which is the second half of Mark 13, Yeshua says the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple uh, in 70 AD is actually a foreshadowing of the end of the world uh, in the last days. It's a foreshadowing of Judgment Day. It's a foreshadowing of the second coming and the return of Messiah as King. And then, at the end of this teaching, Yeshua says this in Mark 13, 35. Therefore, keep watch. Because you don't know when the owner of the house will come back. Whether in the evening or midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. 
If he comes suddenly, don't let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Yeshua says, watch for my coming. Yearn for it. Be alert. And most of all, have your life in order and be prepared. For you don't know when he's going to come. You just you don't know when I'm going to come. Now, a lot of people struggle with this teaching about the end times. Uh, one question uh, raised by, by liberal critics is, well, isn't all, all this teaching about the end times, isn't it fanaticism? Or, or won't it lead to it? Uh, and secondly, even as a believer, uh, do I really have to think about this so much? Uh, is it really that important? Does, does having Yeshua re return in view really make a difference to how I live? And then thirdly, uh, how do I watch for it? Uh, how do I long for his return? What does that mean? So on the overhead, we have our three questions. Uh, number one, what, number one, does end time speculation lead to fanaticism? Number two, what, is, what difference does it really make in my life to have Yeshua's return in view? And number three, how can I properly watch for it? What does it mean to watch? So first, how do we answer the liberal critics who say, isn't all this end time stuff just over the top? Uh, isn't this just religious fanaticism? Uh, Mark 13, 24. Uh, but in these days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened. The moon won't give its life. The stars will fall from the sky. The heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he'll send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of heaven, uh, from the ends of earth to the ends of heaven. Now, we typically don't have that much trouble with the biblical description of Yeshua's first coming. Uh, we love the story of the advent, right? Uh, his birth, the description of the first coming of Messiah. It's so soft and gentle. There's a star in the sky, uh, a baby in the manger. We all love this, regardless of which day you think he was actually born on. But we have a lot more trouble with the description of the second coming, as described here in Mark 13. Because in many ways, it's exactly the opposite of the first coming. Instead, instead of a special star in the sky, we have all the stars falling out of the sky. <laughs> it's just the opposite. And Yeshua is not some sweet, vulnerable little baby here, but he's coming as a fearsome warrior. And everything, everything in the heavens and on the earth is shaking. Earthquakes, sun and moon go dark, sky, stars falling from the sky. And just as Literally, all hell is breaking loose. The Son of Man comes with the clouds in great power and glory. And so the liberal critics, they say, this is too much. Uh, it's too fantastic. Uh, it's too apocalyptic. It's too supernatural. And so a lot of people over the years have tried to reinterpret and redefine it. One liberal approach is to say, Yeshua, he was a great man. He was a product of his times, uh, and his apocalyptic vision was actually historically wrong, they claim. Well, they say, look at Mark 13, verse 30. Yeshua says this, truly I tell you, this generation will surely not pass away until all these things have happened. Yeshua was saying, according to these critics, that the end of the world would happen within the lifetime of his disciples. So they say, Yeshua was simply wrong about all this end of the world stuff. That, that's what they claim. And then, then the second approach, uh, even by some believers, is to try to spiritualize all these passages about the end times, to read it symbolically, not literally. And so when Yeshua says he's coming back within the generation, it simply means, well, his spirit and his teaching uh, will, will, will come to his disciples and go from strength to strength. So we just spiritualize and symbolize all this stuff about the second coming and the tribulation and the apocalypse. Now, with all due respect, both of these approaches are quite wrong. First, verse 30 does not mean Yeshua was mistaken about when the end of the world would come. He doesn't say it would come within the lifetime of his disciples. The critics are just wrong here. Look at the beginning of the chapter. What did the disciples ask, actually ask Yeshua? Look at Mark 13, verse 2. Yeshua says to his disciples, see this great temple, these great temple buildings? 
that one stone will be left on another that won't be torn down. And then within this context of the destruction of the temple, the disciples then ask him in verse 4, Mark 13, 4, tell us when will these things come about? And what will be, what will be the sign when all these things, i.e. the destruction of the temple, are going to be fulfilled? So the disciples are asking, when will the temple be destroyed? When will the Romans attack? When will Jerusalem be sacked? When will these things take place? And then in verse 30, Yeshua is looking back on all his teachings in the chapter. He looks back to the initial question, and he says, I'll tell you when these things, the literal Greek, these things, again, he repeats the same phrase, will occur. He's referring to the destruction of the temple in the year 70 CE, and he says it'll take place within one generation, which it did. In fact, the very same Greek phrase is used here in verse 30, these things, as used back in verse 4 clearly uh, linking the two, clearly linguistically linking the question about the destruction of the temple to the answer about its happening within one generation, which it did. So contrary to these liberal critics, Yeshua was not wrong in his prophecy in verse 30 about these things happening within one generation. Now in answer to the second objection, why can't we just spiritualize all this end times, apocalyptic you know, uh, predictions, why can't we just view it symbolically? Well, in verse 26, Yeshua, perhaps knowing and anticipating uh, these future objections, Mark 13, 26, uh, he says this, and then they'll see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. He says, everyone will see the Messiah return. This is literal. This is a reference to a specific future historical event to come. This is physical, visible, tangible, observable, personal. It's not merely spiritual or metaphorical or symbolic. Indeed, the doctrine of the second coming is a core component of Yeshua faith. And it's mentioned some 300 times in the New Testament. Yeshua himself discusses it numerous times. And you can't, I'm going to contend, you cannot really be a vibrant believer unless you not only believe it, but you actively think about it and let it affect how you live. 1 John 3, verse 2 says this, we know that when he, when Yeshua appears, we'll be like him because we'll see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope set on him purifies himself just as he is pure. John tells us that by setting our minds and our hope on the return of Messiah, this purifies us. Uh, it motivates us to live a pure and holy life. Now, some critics say, if I really believed Yeshua could come at any time, wouldn't that lead me to take the attitude that this world really doesn't matter? Uh, wouldn't it lead people to just disregard to trying to, to solve the problems of this world? Wouldn't it lead me just to be passively waiting around, waiting for the world to end, uh, waiting for Yeshua to return. So this present age wouldn't matter. Or alternatively, wouldn't this doctrine of the last days and the end times and the second coming and judgment day, wouldn't it lead to believers to turn against unbelievers, you know, to smite them, just like we see today uh, in Islam? Wouldn't this teaching lead, lead to a clash of civilizations? And the answer is, if you really understood what this teaching is and its implications, no, absolutely not. In fact, in both cases, just the opposite. So what difference does this doctrine of the second coming make? If I really believe this, what difference will it make in my life? And the answer is, it'll make all the difference in the world if you believe this and grasp it and take it in. So let's talk about it. Here are three quick, three quick reasons why it makes a difference. First, it'll make all the difference in the world to, to your understanding of, of the problems and your attitude towards the problems in our society. It'll make all the difference in the world towards your social engagement. Uh, so that's on the overhead, please, yes. So Mark 13, verse 26 says, then they'll see the Son of Man coming in clouds, the great power and glory. Now when you first read this, you, you think it's saying he's, he's coming through the clouds. He's coming from heaven uh, to earth, descending 
through the clouds. But that's not what it says. It doesn't say he's coming through the clouds, but that he's coming in or with the clouds. That is, he's coming and he's bringing the clouds with him with great power and glory. What does that mean? Two things. First, coming with the clouds could be a reference to the saints, uh, the glorified believers coming with him, because we have this reference of the cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 12, verse 1. But secondly, and I think more importantly, look back to Genesis 1 and 2, paradise. Why is the Garden of Eden paradise? Because the presence of God is there, the absolute immediate presence of God. And in the presence of God's overwhelming beauty and power and glory and holiness, in the presence of his absolute, utter aliveness, nothing dead or diseased or broken or evil or twisted can exist. That's why it's paradise. Because the presence of God is there. But when Adam and Eve decided to be their own lords and saviors, the presence of God left. The absolute immediate presence of God was withdrawn from them. And the earth became like the dark side of the moon. The side of the moon that never sees the sun. It became a place of of darkness and coldness. It became a place of disease uh, and death and hunger and poverty and violence and injustice uh, and greed and lust and hatred. Because through sin and the fall, the immediate tangible presence of God was was removed. But as we move through the Bible, uh, we see that sometimes this presence of God, uh, this, this healing, amazing, powerful presence of God, sometimes it returns and it manifests himself and does great things. Probably the most obvious example we see of this, it reappear, of this reappearing is in the book of Exodus, uh, when the presence of God appears and leads the children of Israel out of slavery uh, and into freedom and redemption and, and liberation on the overhead. And the presence of God comes down into the, ta- into the tabernacle uh, and leads the children of Israel through the wilderness. And what did it look like? What did this absolute immediate presence of God look like? In the day, it looked like a cloud. And at night, it was a fiery glory. The Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God. The glory cloud. The cloud of glory. Uh, it was this radiance and, and revulgence and brilliance of the immediate presence of God. And in this divine presence, nothing diseased, nothing dead, nothing imperfect, nothing evil, nothing twisted can exist. And we see this throughout the Hebrew scriptures. God's glory presence occasionally manifesting itself here and there, even though it was actually absent from the second temple. But guess what? Verse 26 is saying, when Yeshua comes back, he's bringing this glory cloud with him. He's bringing the Shekinah. He's bringing the presence of God to envelop the entire world, to make it again the Garden of Eden. The whole world will be perfected and beautified and restored to its original glory. It'll be the end of death, the end of disease, the end of hunger, the end of poverty, the end of injustice, the end of violence. And then Yeshua gives this illustration. Look at Mark 13, verse 28. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know these, that, that summer's near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that he is near, right at the door. Now, there weren't that many plants in Israel at that time that actually lost their leaves in the wintertime. Most plants in that part of the world kept their leaves, but the fig tree lost its leaves in the winter and only began to come back in the spring and summer. And you know what Yeshua was saying here? He's saying, I'm bringing the ultimate spring the ultimate summer, of which all the best and most glorious springs and summers you've ever seen in your life are but a dim echo of what I'm bringing. I'm bringing the ultimate sunlight uh, after millennia and millennia of winter. And I'm going to bring heaven to earth and make the whole world perfect again. Now, what is this teaching us? What is the doctrine of the second coming? 
Uh, it's that the purpose of Yeshua's salvation is the restoration and the renewal of God's creation. It's the end of poverty and injustice and disease and hunger and evil and death. And anyone who yearns for the second coming, who longs for the second coming, hates the things that God hates and loves the things that God loves and is working in the spirit of God for these things. And not working like the world works uh, without hope, but rather with a certain hope and assurance of knowing that, that, the, uh, uh, that in the end, this new world, uh, this messianic kingdom where Yeshua reigns as king is surely coming. Justice and righteousness will triumph. It will all be made right. And everything sad will become untrue. And notice how at the end of the text, Yeshua exhorts us not to be spiritually sleepy or, or unattentive, but to watch and be alert. Look at Mark 13, verse 36. If he comes suddenly, don't let him find you sleeping. When I say to you, I say to everyone, watch, be alert, yearn for Yeshua's return. Don't be spiritually asleep or unprepared. Uh, don't be like the five foolish virgins in Matthew 25. The philosopher Neil Plantinga, in his book called Engaging God's World, discusses the second coming. And he warns us of the danger of not longing for the second coming. And the overhead, he says this. He says, the second coming of Yeshua the Messiah is good news for, people's, for people whose lives are filled with bad news. If you're a slave in Pharaoh's Egypt, or, or in the American South in the, 19th, or in the 19th century, if you're an Israelite exiled in Babylon, uh, or Kosovar, exiled in Albania. If you're a woman in a culture where if your husband gets mad at you, uh, he can lock you in a closet or beat you or have his buddies threaten to rape you. Or if you're a Jew in the Holocaust. Or a Christian in the Muslim world who's threatened with beheading for your faith. If you're living in sub-Saharan Africa where AIDS has devastated whole populations. If you're in any of these situations, you don't yawn when someone mentions the return of Yeshua the Messiah, the person who wants justice and redemption wants the kingdom of God. And the coming kingdom depends on the coming of the king. He's the one who will return with great power and glory. The second coming of Yeshua the Messiah means that justice will at last fill the earth. Passionate Yeshua followers want that. And so do compassionate Yeshua followers. Now, if your own life is too comfortable to want the second coming of Yeshua, you must look across the world to lives that aren't. It's natural to hope for yourself, but it's unnatural to hope only for yourself. Be on guard, Yeshua says, against that fatal self-absorption. Take care. Stay alert. Be watchful, because the kingdom is coming. Yeshua's words are an antidote to our sloth, an antidote to our worldly cynicism. Yeshua's words are meant to raise our head and raise our hopes for justice. Amen. Do you know what he's saying here? If you kind of know about the second coming, but you're not watching for it, you're not yearning for it, you're not longing for it, it means that you're living in this little bubble. One of the few places in the world today, by the way, and one of the few times in all of human history that's basically comfortable. You're living in a bubble, and you don't know what it's like for most people, or you, or you know and you don't care. Yeshua says, watch for the coming of the kingdom. Yearn for my second coming. Get rid of that spiritual sloth. Get rid of your parochial self-absorption that keeps you from wanting my return. Because the world desperately needs his return. So on the overhead, number one, if you really understand the second coming of Yeshua, it makes all the difference in the world to your social engagement, your social ethics. Number two, it makes all the difference in the world to your personal behavior, your personal ethics, especially your personal integrity. Mark 13, 32. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, not even the Son, but only the Father. This is an amazing statement on the overhead. There's two things and only two things the Bible says you can be sure about the second coming. Number one, it's definitely going to happen. 
Number two, there was no way to predict when it's gonna happen. <laughs> now, the second biblical truth, you would never know from all the evangelical prophecy buff industry, <laughs> with all their endless charts and timelines and predictions, you would never know it looking at all these articles and books on, on when Yeshua is going to return and who the false Messiah is uh, and, and when the tribulation will begin uh, and what events in our modern day news constitute the four horsemen of the apocalypse or which seal has already been broken. But how much more forceful could Yeshua be? Yeshua himself in his earthly human form says, I don't even know. So there's only two biblical certainties about the second coming. It's going to happen, and we don't know exactly when. But if you put these two together, it's a powerful force for personal integrity. If you drill these truths into your heart, you're going to begin to realize that you must never try to justify bad means for the sake of good ends. Among other things, because how do you know the curtain won't come down in the middle of your means? And you must never say, no one sees what I'm doing in the dark. Uh, because how do you know if Yeshua won't call you home? Call you to account at any minute. He tells us this in Matthew 10, 26. For there's nothing concealed that won't be disclosed. Or hidden that won't be made known. C.S. Lewis also talks about hope in the second coming. How it can turn you into a person of personal integrity. This is from his essay called The World's Last Night on the Overhead. He says, precisely because we cannot predict the moment of the second coming, we must be ready at all times. The sentry doesn't know what time the enemy may attack or what time an officer might inspect his post. He must be awake and alert at all times. Now, we should not always be running around in fear that the end might happen at any moment, uh, but we rather, sh rather should be like an 80-year-old man who needs, on the one hand, not to be always thinking about his approaching death, but he should always be taking it into account. It would be criminally foolish not to have his will made, uh, and so on. Interesting illustration. He says, an 80-year-old man shouldn't always be thinking, I might die tomorrow. But on the other hand, an 80-year-old old man should be thinking, I might die tomorrow. <laughs> there has to be a balance. In the same way by the second coming. C.S. Lewis, he continues on in the overhead. He says, now what death is to each person, the second coming is to the whole human race. We must therefore train ourselves to ask more and more often how the things we're saying and doing or failing to say and do, at each moment how this will look when the irresistible light suddenly streams in upon us. That irresistible light that's so different from the light of this world that will reveal all things as they truly are. Women sometimes have a problem of judging by artificial electric lights, how their clothing or their makeup will look in the full light of day. That's what we must do. We have to learn how to dress our souls. How to dress our souls not by the electric light of this present world, but by the brilliant daylight of the next one. The good dress is one that will face that light, for that light lasts forever. On the overhead, the second coming makes all the difference in the world. One, to your social ethics. Two, to your personal ethics. And number three, all the difference in the world to your ability to forgive and make peace with those who've wronged you. Oh, yes, it leads to the opposite of what the liberal critics say. Over the years... I've counseled different people who, about bitterness, about resentment, uh, towards people who've wronged them. And I've noticed that whenever I reference this doctrine of the second coming of Messiah, it's very, very helpful to enable them to put things in perspective and to see things from an eternal point of view. Because when someone wrongs you, unless you stop yourself, you are going to automatically run to the judgment seat of the world and sit on it. Now, ultimately, of course, God sits on the judgment seat. But in one sense, there's no one currently executing justice on the judgment seat of the world. Because King Yeshua, he's not come back yet to sit up his throne and sit on his judgment seat. And we sense that this judgment seat is empty. Because bad things happen 
and no one does anything about it. Terrible things are done and, and there's no redress. People get away with murder. There's no payback. Things are not put right. So there's a sense in this world in which the judgment throne of the world is not yet occupied. And within every human heart, the minute you're wronged, you're going to tend to run right to that judgment seat and try to sit on it. You do this automatically uh, unless you stop yourself. What do I mean? Well, first of all, when someone wrongs you, you're immediately sure what they deserve. You know what they deserve. You're on the throne. And secondly, you, you not only know what they deserve, you want to help them get it. <laughs> oh, yes, at the very least, you want to root, root, root. <laughs> they get what they deserve. And, and you pull for it with all your heart. But we're not meant to be on that throne. It's too big for us. Uh, and it will distort your life if you try to sit on that judgment seat. But your natural tendency is to go there. And when you do, it poisons you. If you stay bitter, if you refuse to forgive, it distorts you, it twists you, uh, and bends and misshapens your soul. If you're, for example, if you're bitter at a woman, you may think all women are like that. If you're bitter at a man, well, all men are like that. If you're bitter at someone from another race or ethnicity, you think all people from that group are like that. Bitterness and unforgiveness distorts you. It poisons you. You must not do it. Well, well how do you not fall into this? How do you overcome bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness? I would propose the doctrine of the second coming is a powerful enough truth to heal your heart from this natural impulse uh, to run and try to sit on that worldly judgment seat and the overhead. First of all, the doctrine of the second coming teaches that only God deserves to be on that judgment seat. Only God deserves to be the judge because you and I are imperfect and we deserve judgment for what we've done. So we have no right to be there on the overhead. Secondly, only God has the knowledge requisite for sitting on that throne. When someone wrongs you and you start to say, I know what they deserve, you think you know that person, but you don't. In fact, bitterness blinds you to who they really are. Have you ever talked to someone uh, who's mad at, at person X? And you know person X pretty well. And when they describe person X to you, you don't really agree. You can tell their view is skewed. It's skewed by their anger at that person. Because when you're angry at someone, you tend to caricature them uh, into a one-dimensional being. You, you play up their bad parts. You play down their good parts. Only God knows what that person has been through. Only God knows who that person really is. Only God knows all that's in their background. Only God knows what they deserve. You don't. So on the overhead, number one, only God has the right to sit on the judgment seat. Number two, only God has the knowledge to be the righteous judge. And number three, only God has the power to give people what they deserve. And the doctrine of the second coming is that someday the Lord will return and put everything right. He will. He is coming to judge the earth. It's not your role or your ability to be the judge. And there's no medicine strong enough to keep your heart from trying to rush into that throne all the, t all the time and take matters into your own hand other than the sure hope and promise of the second coming. So we need to look to the Lord and say, you are God, and I'm not. You're the judge. I'm not. And with the sure hope of the coming of, of the Lord Yeshua, I don't need to try to usurp that throne. I'm free. I can forgive. I can make peace. Uh, I admit, I don't know enough to know what someone deserves. It's not my role. I don't have the right to try to, to give them what I think they deserve. And I'll always under or, or overestimate. So I get off the throne. Don't you see this, this doctrine of the second coming of Yeshua? It has enormous power. Enormous power to change the way you look at society to change the way you handle yourself and your own personal integrity. 
and your attitude towards those who wrong you on the overhead. But there's still a problem. As we've been discussing, if there's no judgment day, there's no hope for the world. Evil triumphs. The blood of the oppressed cries out for justice. But if there is a judgment day, what hope is there for you and for me? You see, it's the height of hypocrisy, the height of uh, the lack of self-awareness to yearn for judgment day for them, but not for you and for me. Judgment day is going to be for everyone. And in Psalm 130, we have this haunting question. Psalm 130, verse 3. O oh Lord, if you kept a record of sins, who could stand? Francis Schaeffer does this little thought experiment. He says, imagine that God puts his invisible tape recorder around your neck when you're born. That's there all your life. But the only thing it ever records is when you tell someone how they ought to be living. So only when you say some, to someone else, you ought or you should or you need to do this, does it start recording. Only when you tell someone, you ought to do this and this is how it should be, does it turn on. In other words, it only records your standards for behavior, your standards for people's lives. And then on that great judgment day, we're all standing before the throne. And God says, you know what? I'm going to be really, really fair. Incredibly fair. I'm not going to judge you by my standards. I'm not even going to judge you by the golden rule or the Ten Commandments or the Bible. I'm only going to judge you by your own standards. So he comes up to you, takes out that invisible tape recorder. You say, hey, I didn't see that there. He says, yeah, I know. It's invisible. <laughs> so the Lord says, let's just play it back. See if you've lived up to your own standards. And even if that's how God did Judgment Day, there's not a person on the face of the earth who would stand. There's not a single person who could pass Judgment Day. And deep down, you know that. So how much less are we going to pass Judgment Day based on the Ten Commandments and God's Word? So we have a problem. We've got to have Judgment Day. And yet, we can't stand in Judgment Day. On the overhead, if there's no Judgment Day, what hope is there for the world? And if there is a Judgment Day, what hope is there for us? So how are we ever going to be able to yearn for the Second Coming? How can we watch for it? How can we long for it? Like this. In Mark 13, we read this. Mark 13, 24. Describing Judgment Day. The sun will be darkened. The moon won't give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And then describing the crucifixion, we read this in Mark, 13, Mark 15, 33. That noon, darkness came down over the whole land till three in the afternoon. And in Matthew 27, 51, we read, at the moment of Yeshua's death, the curtain of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quakes, uh, the rocks split, the tombs broke open. We have earth shaking we have utter darkness. When? When on the cross, Yeshua cries, Matthew 27, 46. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This almost looks like judgment day. It was. It was judgment day come down on Yeshua. Fifteen times in the New Testament, we have Yeshua's uh, coming, ref referred to using this Greek word parousia, which means his presence. And it gets across the idea that at the second coming, Yeshua is going to bring the ultimate sunlight, the presence of God that will heal you of everything. On the overhead, Yeshua will bring the infinitely healing presence of God. He'll bring the ultimate life that will vanquish all death, the ultimate love the that banquet that, that, that banishes all loneliness. The ultimate light that defeats all darkness and ignorance and evil. But on the cross, Yeshua experienced not the infinite healing presence of God, but the infinitely devastating absence of God. On the overhead, at the second coming, he's coming with light. But at the first coming, he didn't come to bring judgment, but to bear it. At the first coming, he gets the absence of God in our place. He gets the rejection. He gets the death. He gets the darkness. 
Darkness came down on him at noon until 3 p.m. Why? He paid the penalty so that we can get the presence of God, so that we can get his love, so that we can get his light, so that we can get his life. And the overhead, here's the gospel, that the great judge of the universe was willing to be judged for us. The great judge of the universe was willing to leave the throne, leave his judgment seat, and stand in our place in the defendant's dock. In the book of Revelation, John looks up at the throne of God. What does he see on that throne? A lamb. He sees a lamb where a judge should be. Why? Because our judge has taken our judgment on himself for us. To become a Yeshua follower is to say, I can't stand in the judgment. I can never pass on my own. But my judge was willing to come and take my judgment for me. And I am moved by that. And now, Lord, I ask you to forgive me and accept me because of what Yeshua has done. Not on my own merit, but on his And if you do that, one day you will stand before him gloriously complete. Yeshua is coming to judge the living and the dead. He's coming to judge the earth. But if you are abiding in him, then despite all the persecutions and the afflictions you may face, with uplifted head, you can anxiously await for him. Him who has already taken on your judgment for you and removed from you all curse, And you will abide in his glorious light and love forever. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Hallelujah. The music team, come on up. Father, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for this word today to be on guard. For us to be like a sentry at his post. uh, Like a watchman on the wall. Help us to be alert. To be not, to be spiritually asleep but to wait for it, to watch for it, to yearn for it, to long for your return. You are coming to judge the earth, to judge the earth with righteousness and with justice. You tell us, if we have this hope within us, it'll purify us. It'll keep us sober-minded, awaiting your soon coming. Help us be prepared for this day. Help us walk in holiness. Help us not to be self-absorbed in our own little man-centered bubble but to eagerly anticipate the coming kingdom, which we know depends on the coming of the king. We pray for your coming rule and reign, Lord Yeshua. King Yeshua, come with great power and glory. Lord, help us daily to ask, how are the things I'm doing and saying, or not doing and not saying, how will they look when your irresistible light suddenly streams in upon me? Help me to forgive others. Because I've seen how much I've been forgiven. And I've been forgiven only because you, Yeshua, the judge, took my judgment. Judgment day came down on you so that I could be forgiven and redeemed. (laughs) Hallelujah. Thank you, Yeshua. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat shalom.